Hello, Geography 232 students. Welcome to week five of analysis and modeling. This week, we're going to be talking about monitoring change. We are going to have a, a quick review of multispectral imagery. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where to actually find multispectral imagery. I've got a couple of different data sources I'm going to mention. Uh, and then we're going to get into change, de change detection. There are a few different techniques that we can uh, apply to detect change on the landscape. Uh, so we'll get into that. And then that will uh, segue right into your uh, lab for the week. So we'll discuss uh, one of the techniques that you'll be using specifically in the lab assignment. All right, so this week, uh, the lecture is um, change detection in raster imagery. This week's lab is classify land cover to measure shrinking lakes. It's going to be a case study, a lake in China. Got three different aerial images that have been remotely sensed over a period over basically 15 years apart over a 30 year period. And so you will essentially classify those and then use several different classification uh, kind of cleanup techniques to minimize artifact pixels. And then you will basically compare uh, the, the, the shrinking of a lake that occurs over this period of time from around 1985 to 2014. So upon completion of this lecture and lab, you should know how to define change detection, identify various change detection techniques, classify multispectral images using unsupervised classification, and apply techniques to detect change on the landscape. Quick outline, uh, four different sections, how to use imagery, selecting imagery, what is change detection, and change detection methods. So how to use imagery. How do you use imagery? Remotely sensed imagery takes many forms. Uh, as I've already talked about, we spent some time talking about multi-spectral multi imagery, um, RGB bands, and briefly last week on hyperspectral and ultraspectra. Uh, but ultimately, it takes many different forms, including panchromatic, which might be one that we take for granted. It's one that we see most frequently, like in the form of maybe uh, Google Maps or Google Earth, right? So a panchromatic image, um, it's uh, formed using total light energy in the visible spectrum, rather than dividing the light spectrum into various bands along the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so it's, it's essentially a single value per pixel, often a 0 to 255 digital number that's rendered in black and white typically, uh, but then it can be mapped to uh, coded values which can actually colorize it. But ultimately it's, it's um, because of the fact it takes in uh, a larger amount of solar radiation reflected from the surface, it allows for uh, high resolution ground sample distance or uh, resolution. So when we talk about the uh, Landsat system, so Landsat 7, 8, and 9, which launched recently, uh, there are 30 meter uh, ground sample distance uh, pixels on the multispectral imaging uh, sensors, but for its panchromatic sensor, it's actually a 15 meter resolution, which is uh, essentially double the resolution. And it's able to do that because the panchromatic sensor takes in a lot more light energy uh, per pixel and uh, that allows for a higher resolution image because it doesn't need to sample such a large a swath of the landscape to gather the same amount of light energy. So that's panchromatic. Uh, true color RGB is multispectral but with just the red, green, and blue uh, bands occupying those red, green, and blue channels on, on a monitor. Uh, and then multispectral, as we've talked about, um, oh, I got a typo there. And then multispectral, as we've talked about, it's red, green, and blue, plus uh, uh, at least one other band. So maybe it's near infrared or shortwave infrared, thermal, so on and so forth. So it's the RGB plus. Um, uh, bands of the electromagnetic spectrum which are not visible to the human eye. Hyperspectral is just ever smaller bands along the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the closer the bands are, the, the more essentially continuous they are along the spectrum. And ultra, we're talking about thousands of, of little tiny slivers of light along the electromagnetic spectrum which allow for greater detail but again take in uh, much much less light on a per band basis. So uh, the value of remotely sensed imagery is in its ability to provide actionable intelligence. So as I've talked about before, actionable intelligence is essentially the 
the uh, meat and potatoes or the, the foundational value of GIS, right? So we can we can take raw data. It might look pretty on a map screen, or uh, you know, might look computer look pretty on a computer screen rather. Uh, but it's the ability to pull actionable intelligence from raw data that gives GIS its value, right? So. Uh, I like to look at it from uh, the perspective of the, you know, answering a couple of questions. So can it answer a question? So can can the imagery actually answer a question that we have? Maybe it's about uh, something practical like crop yields, or maybe it's something like a military, you know, benefit. And, you know, are there troop buildups in a location or whatever it is? Can it answer a question? Can it solve a problem? Uh, can it be used to inventory things? Can we use it to count features on the landscape? Maybe count, uh, you know, the number of trees in an area or the number of um, housing units in some, you know, square mile or square kilometer. Uh, so it can be used to inventory things. Uh, does it show evidence of something? As I mentioned, you know, with the military example, does it show evidence of uh, troop buildups or maybe mil missile silos or something like that? Uh, does it show composition of the landscape? So when we factor in multispectral near infrared, um, the near infrared band, can we actually see uh, the composition of the landscape? Like where are the healthier fields versus the less healthy fields? Where are the bare rock, uh, exposed bare rock versus uh, trees? Does it show the composition of the landscape? Um, and then finally, when compared to other points in time, does it show changes on the landscape? So if we take in multiple images of the same location from different periods of time and we compare the two, does it show changes? So it's it's basically the ability of aerial imagery to answer these sorts of questions that uh, that gives it its, its value. Uh, so much imagery exists today uh, and is available. And so if you uh, open up the PDF document of this, this week's lecture notes, uh, each of these are hyperlinks and you can actually link to uh, the USGS Earth Explorer, NASA Earth Data, NOAA Digital Coast, ESA Copernicus, and the EO Sentinel Lab. And then there's a, a list of about 20 or so other remotely sensed imagery uh, data sources or hubs. Okay, so each of these um, is either a, a viewer where you can view data on the screen and or um, a data hub where you can actually download the data and then pull it into a GIS. Um, some of them require, I think most of them uh, require you sign up, it's free, you know, you just have to create an account. So just be aware of that. I don't think you have to with Earth Explorer, I, you have to with EO Sentinel Hub, I believe. Uh, but ultimately, you'll basically be able to preview the location. Uh, so you'll, you'll zoom to a location on Earth, and then it'll show you the data that's that are available for that location. And uh, like with USGS Earth Explorer, you can choose your data source, your sensor source. So do you want it from Landsat? five landsat seven landsat eight uh, what have you um and so the, obviously the benefit of choosing multiple um, landsat sources is you're able to compare imagery over time going back uh, to the 1980s i believe i think 1975 is the earliest but it becomes more prevalent in the 80s uh, so imagery must often be processed to answer questions right so once we pull the data we still have to do something with it Good quality inputs yield good quality results. And I talk about uh, the GIGO principle, garbage in, garbage out. You've probably heard that if you have any kind of computer science experience, uh, experience or anything. So the GIGO principle essentially says that whatever you hope to get out of a um, an analysis will only be as good as the data inputs that you, you put into it, right? So good quality begets good information. So always keep that in mind. Uh, and image processing is essential to production. So like, again, um, a aerial image may be pretty and it may give you uh, quite a bit of information just with the naked eye, right? And we talk about um, the elements of image interpretation, right? So there may be quite a bit of information you can get without um, actual geoprocessing, but uh, processing is essential uh, to the process. Uh, so what type of information can be extracted from imagery? Uh, Foundation mapping, so essentially setting the foundation for other projects in the con in the form of land cover. So if we want to see what the dominant land cover is in an area, is it forest, grass, shrub, urban landscape, water, what have you. Uh, land use, so in the context of actual developed land, we can use aerial imagery to, to monitor the type of land use. Is it um, low density uh, residential? Is it high density residential, commercial, light industrial, heavy, heavy industrial? Um, is it parks and recreation areas, a water, what have you, right? So we have in the in the form of land cover, that's natural landscapes. In the form of land use, it's how we've actually changed the landscape. 
uh, parcels and building footprints. So we can use aerial imagery to uh, to build out a, a parcel data set or a cadaster uh, data set for tax assessment, perhaps. Uh, cartographic features, we can use aerial images to map roads and natural features like streams, rivers, mountains, things like that. Uh, we can derive various forms of uh, elevation models from aerial imagery. So digital DTMs, digital terrain models, DEMs, digital elevation models, those are all derived from aerial imagery uh, with or without uh, a LIDAR um, elevation component. You can actually pull a lot of that just from remotely sensed imagery. Uh, in a kind of piggybacking on that, we also have we can also pull slope and aspect out. So slope is essentially the angle uh, of slope of, of like the surface, mountains versus flat surface. And aspect is the angle of that slope um, on a, in a 360 degree uh, context. And finally, hydrographic flow. We can use aerial imagery uh, to map watersheds and rivers and also look at floodplain mapping. Uh, so if we want to find out if someone's home is in a floodplain, we can use um, raster data to, to map that. So what type of information can be extracted from it, uh, from imagery? Uh, situational management and temporal information, for example, weather data, so rainfall, sea surface temperatures, uh, agricultural data, which like we've talked about in the past, so crop health, like last week's lab, uh, crop emergence and senescence, so that's essentially the, uh, the act of new uh, agricultural growth. Uh, and legal compliance, so making sure that you know one person's property is monitored compared to others. Um, forestry, so inventory, the types of trees that might exist in a forest. Disease monitoring, like bark beetles and things like that. Animal habitats. Uh, fire suppression, so CAL FIRE relies heavily on remotely sensed imagery. Uh, and with that, we can map fire scars and we can also track fires in real time if we're getting a constant flow of data. Um, useful in engineering and construction, so design and monitoring, um, essentially looking at what exists on the landscape and then superimposing blueprints onto the landscape in the form of maybe CAD data or GIS data. Uh, emergency response, so damage assessment after maybe a tornado or a hurricane or a flood. Uh, ingress and egress routes, so what sorts of routes might get blocked by, we'll say, a down power line or down trees or a fire. Uh, ingress is the ability to get into a, a uh, disaster zone, egress is the ability to get out. Also um, flooding and humanitarian issues, maybe looking at migration paths or you know, so military buildups, things like, things like that. And then finally, uh, science. So material identification, like identifying what the dominant uh, rock formations are, uh, maybe for geology or glaciology, monitoring the extent of glaciers. And then if you've got you know, you've probably seen it before, images of glaciers in the past versus images of the glaciers today. You can compare the change if taken at the same point uh, over the course of a year because you want to make sure that you're taking uh, an apples to apples comparison. So if you have an image of a glacier uh, in January and you want to compare it to, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you need to make sure that that image is also from January versus June, at which point, you know, natural seasonal changes would have an effect. One last point to touch on in the topic of image collection and access to imagery. So when looking for imagery, you have to sort of look at it from the perspective of a Venn diagram, right? So you can like envision it like this. In one circle, we have all of the features or the images that are available. In another circle or universe, we have only those that we are uh, interested in, right? And so we essentially have everything that's out there and then those that meet our search criteria. What you want to focus on is that overlap, right? where the features that meet your criteria are actually available, right? So features that are available to work with. Uh, so the principle is like this. So some features are of interest. Some features can real realistically be extracted or, or collected. And you only want those that meet those two criteria. So you want to work at the intersection of those two features. At the intersection of those two are the ones that are going to provide actionable intelligence. And it's not always easy, right? So sometimes we might have a very narrow focus for our research projects, for example. Um, sometimes you might need to widen your focus slightly to kind of expand that overlap in the, in the Venn diagram. Other times you might need to expand the option, the, uh, the sorry, expand the available imagery, right? So if you're only searching uh, USGS, you might need to expand that to include the European Space Agency or uh, some other data source, okay? So uh, if you're finding that the overlap is too fine or too minimal, you need to expand one or the other.
but ultimately you want to make sure that you can kind of block out the noise and only focus on those images that meet your criteria within those that are actually available. All right, selecting imagery. So what are the criteria for image selection? Uh, the challenge is to separate real change from spectral change. So this is in the, in the context of uh, change detection, right? So you'll notice here, uh, I've got two images um, and one is pretty clear, not a cloud in the sky. And the other one, about half the image is covered by clouds, right? So we often get spoiled when it comes to aerial imagery. We'll see a really nice you know, photo image of Earth's surface and there's just not a cloud in the sky. Well, you'll find when you start to work with aerial imagery that oftentimes that's more the exception than the rule, right? So the great thing about a lot of these uh, image hub servers where we download aerial imagery like USGS or NASA, the European Space Agency, is that they allow you to filter imagery by cloud cover. So it could be as minimal as not a single cloud in the sky or maybe 10% coverage all the way up to 100% coverage. Obviously, once you get to a certain point, uh, the images become unusable. And so it's about kind of finding that sweet spot. Uh, you're going to find a very small percentage of images have no clouds at all, depending on where you're looking. If it's Southern California, that's not such a problem, but if it's like perhaps Amazon or the Pacific Northwest, you're going to find a lot of clouds, right? So what you wanna do is sort of adjust your expectations with regards to where you're looking and what you might find. But ultimately uh, the, the key thing when it comes to change detection is minimizing the amount of uh, spectral noise, if you will, and so you can actually zero in on the actual changes on the landscape and not just uh, artifacts in the image, in this case, too much clouds or, or smoke perhaps, or light pollution. So uh, you wanna choose images that were collected at the same time of day. And why is that? Because, well, the sun is going to be at a specific angle at a certain time of day, given the time of year, and you want it to be uh, as uniform as possible. So, I mean, high noon is ideal, right? So that you, you have as few shadows on the landscape as possible. Uh, another factor to take into account is the time of year, the season, right? So I, I early year in this lecture, I mentioned uh, glaciation. If you are doing research on gla glaciers, you want to make sure that you are looking at glaciers uh, in any given year at the same point in the year, right? So for example, if you were looking at glacial minimums, you'd want to look in the month of perhaps June or July or August in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're looking at glacial maximums, you'd want to look in the months of December, January, February, right? Again, in the Northern Hemisphere, flip it around for the Southern Hemisphere. But ultimately, you need to have an apples to apples comparison, or else you'll end up with essentially false positives, right? You might say, oh, there's massive decline or massive increases if you compare June to December. Um, ultimately, another important step is, as I said before, uh, choosing as cloud free an image as possible. Uh, and if possible, you'd like to pick images from the same image sensor. Now, that's not always possible, especially if you're looking at historical imagery going back to you know the 90s or the 80s, uh, you're gonna have to use imagery from older Landsats. But uh, if it's more current data, ideally it's best to choose them from the same sensor because you're gonna have essentially the same image quality and you would expect the same sorts of kind of you know, idiosyncrasies or characteristics of an individual uh, sensor. And lastly, ideally, you want to choose images that have been atmospherically corrected. Essentially, what that means is that uh, extra noise has been stripped from the images by the sensors themselves. So just kind of to summarize criteria for image selection, images need to be collected at about the same time of day to reduce differences in sun angle. Ideally, images from different years should be within the same month to avoid seasonal and phenological differences. And that, that's the, in the context of differences in vegetation greenness, right? So if we're going to look at uh, perhaps uh, forestry health, we want to make sure that we're looking at one single month over the course of several years versus comparing uh, season to see, uh, different seasons to different seasons. So if you want to look at uh, maximum green foliage, you might want to look in the month of May, June, uh, May, June, or maybe July. If you want to look at uh, maybe the surface without a lot of foliage, you want to look in those fall or winter months, right? Uh, but that's the key thing. Uh, another thing, be aware of different annual precipitation amounts. So drought years versus non-drought years, but even uh, with regards to maybe monsoon rains. So if you're looking in like Southeast Asia or South Asia or Central America, where there's a distinct wet and dry season, be mindful of that. So if you're looking at the landscape in the month of June in, in India, you might see a lot of rain. If you look in the month of December, not so much, right? So just be mindful of uh, wet seasons and dry seasons 
drought years and non-drought years and uh, try to control for those differences as much as possible by maintaining consistency uh, with the, the months that you're choosing. All right, so what is change detection? So change detection uh, in, in GIS is a method for understanding how a given area has changed between two or more time periods. And there are multiple ways of doing that, and I'll get into that momentarily. Change detection involves comparing changes between aerial images taken over different time periods of the same geographic location. Okay, that's the key thing. Different time periods, same geographic location. Uh, and ideally, uh, from with the same sensor, but that's not always possible. So what are some likely applications of change detection? Forestry management, so changes in tree cover due to wildfire or land clearing. Urbanization, like you can quantify the sprawl over time. Like it's always very interesting to look at urban sprawl of some American cities like Las Vegas or Houston or Dallas, even Los Angeles, but over that's over a longer time period where you can see what it looked like 20, 30, 40 years ago versus today. Uh, and you can use remote sensing to actually quantify the growth and, and the, the growth of urbanization or the loss of open space around the urban core. Uh, land degradation due to overgrazing or storms is sort of uh, relevant to last week's uh, lab. We, we, we looked at um, the damage to cornfields based off of a hailstorm, right? But you might also be able to manage, uh, monitor uh, pasture health or crop health uh, with remote sensing. And finally, uh, perhaps rising or lowering reservoir levels, right? So that's a, a key thing in California where we're constantly facing drought threats, um, real and, and potential. And so with remote sensing, we can actually monitor uh, the extent of reservoirs and help us get an idea uh, of the current state of our uh, water health in the state. So information that can be derived from satellites. Uh, where and when the change has taken place, how much and what kind of change has occurred, uh, what are the cycles and trends in the change, but then some things that satellites cannot tell us, and these are key, how and why the change has taken place, right? So we can find out where, we might be able to find out how much, might be able to find out what, but the how and the why are always the, the open questions that are uh, open to interpretation and confounding variables and things like that. So be mindful of drawing uh, conclusions on the how and the why, but really you can what you can really dig into is the where, the how much, and the what. So um, broad categories of change. So uh, change in shape or size of patches of, of land cover types. So for example, urbanization, those are fairly easily monitored with uh, aerial imagery, or remote sen remotely sensed imagery. Uh, slow changes in cover type or species composition versus abrupt land cover transitions. So we might be able to see the growth of a particular plant species like um, palm oil in uh, Indonesia or uh, maybe some sort of introduced species in, in another part of the world uh, versus abrupt land cover transitions like from uh, wildfire or deforestation. So it's always interesting. I don't have a map of this one, but it's always interesting to look at the border between Haiti and the, the Dominican Republic, where the Dominican Republic has practiced uh, more conservative uh, deforestation policies where they've really minimized deforestation in their interior, whereas Haiti has not had that degree of uh, forest management. And so you can see a very clear uh, border uh, on the landscape where all the trees in Haiti have been, not all of them, but the vast majority have been deforested, whereas in the Dominican Republic, it's still fairly lush. So uh, things like that are definitely easily tracked and monitored with remotely sensed imagery. Uh, slow changes in condition of a single cover type, for example, forest degradation due to insects like the bark beetle or disease, uh, and then changes in timing of extent of seasonal processes like drought monitoring. Okay, so all, each of these are broad categories of change that can be monitored with uh, change detection techniques in GIS. Uh, change detection using remote sensing. So changes on the landscape can be detected as changes in the spectral values of pixels. That's the key thing to remember. So changes on the landscape can, can be detected as changes in the spectral values of pixels. So again, when, it go, when we talk about um, the different time periods of the same location, the same location is key because essentially you can have a one for one location where a pixel, a single pixel, represents the same location in two different time periods. And then all it takes is a uh, essentially a measuring of the pixel value then versus now, or you know, at uh, 20 years ago versus 10 years ago versus right now. And so if you measure those differences in values, we can start to pull out some information, some change information. 
So an example would be um, uh, pre and post burn. So healthy vegetation has a, a very high reflectance in the um, green and the near infrared, but low in shortwave infrared. So that's healthy vegetation. Burned areas have low reflectance in green and near infrared, but high in shortwave uh, infrared. And so we can see here comparing with the NDVI analysis, we can tell what areas have been burned versus those that have not because of that difference in reflect, uh, reflection. So what are some change detection goals? Uh, identification of the geographical locations and types of change. So we want to be able to find uh, the locations and the types of changes. Uh, we want to be able to quantify those changes, actually measure them. So not just find out where they're at and what types they are, but actually find out how much change has taken place. And lastly, assessment of the accuracy of the change detection results. So there are ways to essentially ground truth based off of all, um, extra other sources, alternative sources. So it's about identifying the location, finding out what types of changes have occurred, quantifying the change, measuring it, and then assessing the accuracy of the results whenever possible by comparing to uh, alternative sources. Okay, and finally, let's look at some change detection methods. I'll briefly touch on three different change detection methods, uh, visual inspection, classification, and image differencing. Visual inspection or visual interpretation involves the, de the delineation of change on a computer screen. All right, so essentially it's the idea of identifying the differences uh, and just sort of making them visually known. Now, once they're visually known, we can measure the differences. We can actually quantify them, right? But ultimately, visual inspection is more about finding uh, where and what has changed. It's less about the exact measurements. So this allows production of results that are automatically in digital form. So we can take an image, uh, we can essentially vectorize the differences, and then we can make a, make a feature class uh, that can then be compared to other uh, shapes and so on. And that's what actually what we'll be doing uh, in this, this week's lab. So it's good for large changes like shape or size of large patches on the landscape. So in this week's lab, for example, we're going to be looking at changes to a large reservoir. Uh, it's actually the largest reservoir in China. And because it's at such a scale that um, a 10 year difference can actually drastically increase the footprint of this lake or shrink the footprint of this lake, we are mostly interested in that. So it's not really these minute differences uh, in growth. So it's not like, all right, this this forest grew by, you know, 5% uh, total of, you know, say 100 square meters or 100 hectares, right? Uh, it's more like the size of this lake grew massively or shrunk massively. And that's all we know. We just know that there's been a significant change. Uh, and it's not so much about the actual measurement, the numbers. It's more just identifying and, and acknowledging there's been significant growth on the landscape. So it's not as good for subtle changes like land degradation, as I said, and it does not take advantage of spectral response. It's really just about what we see on that RGB, uh, the RGB spectrum, and it's easy, more, more or less easy to have our eye corroborate what the GIS is saying. Okay. So I've got an example here, a visual inspection case study. This is a mountaintop mining in West Virginia uh, over um, a, uh, I think about a 20 year period uh, in four year increments. So 1984, 1988, 1992, 1996, 2000, 2004, 2008, and then a comparison of 1984 to 2015. So again, same location, different time periods, and it's pretty evident without any sort of geoprocessing or spatial analysis whatsoever that we can identify, yes, this mountaintop mine has grown significantly uh, and has more or less moved from east to west over this nearly 30 year period. All right, so let's, I'm gonna go through more time with a little bit more speed and we can actually watch the growth in real time. So we can take a look at it. So significant growth um, and no necessarily, n not necessarily relying on spatial analysis. So another technique to detect change is with classification. So land cover classification, uh, we generally, again, need at least two data sets, right? Um, it's uh, two minimum, or we can have more if we want to compare multiple years. Uh, we subtract one classified image from another to identify changes, but the, so the, that's a great system. It works real well, but the problem is that 
it's relying on um, essentially a generalization, right? So instead of making a pixel by pixel comparison, we're classifying uh, all the pixels that fall within some sort of boundary. So we'll say like those that uh, have a, a spectral signature similar to green, we say that each of those represents, um, we'll say uh, grass or, you know, trees or something like that. And then we class them all into one single green class or the, the, the grass class or the tree class, right? Uh, anything that's water, we class that as water. Anything that's urban, class it as urban. So essentially we can, we can take the entire landscape and then condense it down into four or five, maybe six different categories. And then we look at the differences um, for year to year based off of those preset categories, those four or five or six different classes. What you need to be mindful of is that errors from each classified map will be multiplied in the change map because going back to that Geigo principle I mentioned earlier, garbage in, garbage out. So with unsupervised classification and supervised classification, there will always be some margin of error, which I've talked about in the past. And so when you classify images before looking at the differences, any sort of um, errors in the classification will then be multiplied when you're when you're essentially uh, subtracting one for the from the other, because if you are looking at a, 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 a misclassified portion, we'll say one area was classified as urban, but it's actually rural, or we'll say grass or trees, uh, and then we say, okay, well this changed over time, but it didn't actually change over time. It was just misclassified. So that, that's what you have to worry about. So uh, the Geigo principle says that if you are using two different classified images to monitor change, you might end up getting erroneous outputs because the inputs are not perfect. Um, so subtle changes within a class may be ignored by change analysis as well. So it's good on a, a small scale map, meaning a large area, but not so good necessarily on a, a large scale or small, a small area map. So this here is taken from a, a case study, a land cover in lake management in China. Uh, this land use and land cover change map uh, from the Yunnan uh, Guizhou Plateau uh, in southeast, southwest China rather, uh, is looking at differences between 1974 and 2008. We've got an image from 74, 88, 98, and 2008, so uh, almost 10 year increments here. And you can see that uh, more or less uh, there's been notable agricultural growth in the southern region. So that pink color is agriculture. In 1974, we can see that there was, um, you know, agriculture around the lake, but as the years progressed, those agricultural areas uh, expanded farther and farther. And we can also see a massive growth of the urban uh, classification in the north from 74 to 2008. The urban area sprawled significantly. And then having four classified images, if we want to actually quantify the differences, we can use map algebra. Essentially, uh, we can subtract, you know, developed from developed, uh, agriculture from agriculture, and we can get the old versus the new and find out what the new, uh, the total difference is over time. All right, another change detection technique is known as image differencing. And unlike classification, this looks at pixel by pixel differences uh, rather than class by class differences. So essentially you subtract image one from image two, but really it's about uh, pixel A in image one versus minus pixel A in image two, pixel B in image one minus pixel B in image two and so on and so forth. Uh, positive or negative values indicate changes. So if there's a plus or a minus, it means there's been some sort of change. Uh, if it's a zero, it means no changes occurred. Image dates can be individual bands or uh, image transformations. For example, NDVI, Savi, NBR, all the various rendering techniques we've applied or talked about so far. Uh, the advantages of this technique is that they can be used to detect subtle changes. As I said, it's pixel by pixel versus class by class, and it's easy to compute. Okay, so the actual math is fairly quick and simple for, for the computer. Uh, disadvantage is that it's not always easy to interpret, and uh, the best example of that would be the green versus purple color uh, scheme that we applied for the, the cornfield damage assessment last week, right? So it doesn't always make easy sense until we can start to classify and interpret and explain what the different colors are uh, with, with a legend. All right, so we have an example here of image differencing. Uh, in this case here, it's vegetation differences in a burn scar. So what we're looking at is uh, the station fire burn severity map. In this case here, we uh, we can see that the NBR difference of the before and after is displayed here on the legend on the right. So essentially, it is 
the NBR score of a pre-fire area and then the NBR score of the post-fire area. In both uh, images, the before and after, uh, the NBR ratio is applied. So NBR is near infrared minus shortwave infrared divided by the sum of near infrared and shortwave infrared. Um, and so then we compare the differences between NBR pre-fire and NBR post-fire. And that is the output here, the difference of normalized burn ratios between August 6th and September 23rd, 2009. Uh, and again, this is a pixel by pixel comparison versus a class by class comparison. Uh, so I've included the NBR um, formula here for your reference. And that concludes this week's lecture. If you have any questions, please post on the discussion board or send me an email and have a good one. Bye bye.